Good morning, Z Learning visitors. It's Milo from Riverbank Zoo and Garden, and boy, has it been way too long since I have jumped on live right here at the Zoo and Garden. Today, we are in for a very special treat because it is our one and only live feature we are doing this week right at Riverbanks. It is great to see all of you starting to tune in live this morning. Today, if you couldn't tell, we are inside our aquarium and reptile complex. I wanted to get you all settled in before we head behind the scenes into one of our newest areas here in the building. In fact, it kind of was finished under construction during our temporary closure. And we are so excited to now introduce you all to this new space today. Good morning, Faith. Nice to see you virtually versus yesterday in person in the park. Piper, good morning, David. Good morning, Brandy. Oh, it is so great to see all of you familiar faces. I needed this recharge this morning. Christina, Maxim, Abby, good morning, and welcome to Z Learning, everybody. Oh, and Janelle, welcome from the middle of te Tennessee. Oh, that's amazing. So today I am not gonna be by myself, even though I kind of have the place to myself right now here in one of our visitor areas. We are actually going to be heading behind the scenes into our brand new reptile nursery. And I'm gonna be joined by a familiar face, Karen, one of our herpetologist team members. And she is going to give us all the information we need about these new hatchlings right here at Riverbanks. So send in all your questions. Oh, Aiden was wondering real quick, you wanted to see the false gharial? Let me go ahead and turn around the camera. This is who I'm hanging out with right next to. Let me get my reflection out of the way though. Hopefully you can see him a little bit better. We'll do a quick little break before we head on in to our reptile nursery this morning. So everyone tune in with me. Hopefully we keep good service. Let me know if you're still able to hear and see us this morning, but let me go ahead and actually turn around our camera. I wanna show you what this new area looks like. You can see the big nursery banner on top, this big kind of picture window. If you're wondering where we are in the building, it's actually directly across from where our King Cobras live. But this is really where our conservation initiatives really do hit the ground or hatch out of the ground, I should say. But we are going to head inside. But when I say behind the scenes, we're kind of on scenes. This is a view that where I'm standing from right now guests can actually get this perspective. So we're gonna give you a, let's say a behind the scenes tour of the area, but we encourage you all to come out to Riverbanks and come see for yourself. Let's go ahead and give the door a knock and see if Karen is ready. Good morning, nice to see you. All right, Karen, I'm gonna come in and squeeze past you real quick. Let me go ahead and turn around the camera quick. We're gonna kind of be in this, I wouldn't say small space. It's tight because obviously it's made for small animals. It's made for little kiddos. We're not going to be putting our Komodo dragons in here by any means. But let me go ahead and turn around this camera yet again and introduce y'all to Karen. You've all seen Karen before. We've met her with lots of different reptiles, Komodo dragons, more recently our anaconda. But Karen, explain to us what is the goal of this area? I know it's been a long time in the making. It's finally finished, finally complete. Tell me kind of where it all started, who helped bring it to happen, and give us the story. Yeah, so um, we've been waiting for an uh, opportunity to be able to uh, showcase a lot of our young baby uh, reptiles and or amphibians, um, whereas uh, some of our exhibits, most of our exhibits, aren't quite the right space uh, sure. for those animals to be housed, um, as they're tiny and uh, need, <laughs> need a more intricate level of care. Um, so uh, this nursery um, that recently um, helped was funded uh, got built um, so that we have a nice big viewing window as you guys could see. Uh, so you guys all get the opportunity to be able to see what some of our baby reptiles look like. So right now all of you are going to get a very tailored tour. We're going to see lots of visitors kind of walking past our, our viewing window here today. But you notice that there are specifically modified habitats or incubators even for all these different types of reptiles. Now, Karen's gonna cover a good bit of them. We're gonna introduce a whole lot of them, but one thing that you're gonna notice is they're very small. So we're gonna try to give you all the best view that we possibly can. But Karen, why don't you go ahead and just introduce us to the first species that catches your eye. Yeah, so we'll start uh, over here on your left, Milo. 
Yeah. Um, which you guys have met uh, one of these babies before. These are our baby green tree pythons. Um, so they hatched back uh, December 2019. So this animal uh, is still quite small and you can still see has its yellow coloration, whereas the adults um, become more green. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it still takes a good bit of time uh, for them to uh, get a good size and start uh, changing that color pattern. Um, so yeah, this animal is what, that's about six, seven months old. I was just gonna say, <laughs> I was trying to count the months in my head. Yeah, you're right, it's about six, seven months. But it doesn't honestly look like this individual has grown a whole lot. Is that typical for this type of snake? Um, it can be. Um, they actually have grown a decent bit. Um, okay. So I was going to say, you see them so much more. They the size when they hatched. Wow. Um, yeah. So it gives you an idea of how small and how tiny uh, they were. So back in uh, maybe May or June. Yeah, when we, we did the feature. Yeah. Uh, did the feature with these guys. They so they smaller. haven't grown too much since then. Well, and that's such a great example, Karen, because like she had just mentioned, these animals are so small. If we were to put them in our larger habitats, y'all really would not be able to see them. But more importantly, our animal care specialists wouldn't be able to find them very easily to monitor their growth, their health. Are they eating everything they need to? All of those good things that we do with all of our animal residents. So by having them in their own specialized habitats, now on display, we can provide that top quality care. Right, and part of that small enclosure isn't necessarily for easy keeper uh, work, yep. um, but it also for reptiles, um, putting a small reptile inside a large, large habitat can be quite stressful for a baby. Um, so making them feel safe and secure, not out in the open and super visible, um, like we've designed some of the exhibits with our larger animals because they do already feel safe and secure. Um, so the guests can see them as well. Uh, we have to make some of their habitats a little bit more. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of plant material in here. Sure. So it feels hidden, it feels safe, um, and it can thrive that way. Now, I think I'm safe to say this. Is this our only individual of this species in this entire habitat? Yes. So there's not a social grouping. Let me go ahead and kind of pan back a little bit just to give you a little bit more of a size comparison. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and just kind of put my thumb next to the glass so you can see just how tiny we are talking. Now, Luke, age eight, was wondering about how long is this individual snake? That, and they're all coiled <laughs> up. <laughs> that animal might be about, um, I don't know, eight, six to eight inches sure. long, stretched yeah. out. Yep. Well, and if you notice, that's a natural behavior for that variety of snakes, specifically that species, to coil up and kind of hang out on those branches just like you're seeing right now. Great question, Luke. But honestly, we wouldn't want to uncoil that snake and measure them because that would stress them out. And obviously we don't want to do that today. Of course not. Who else do we have in All here right. though, Karen? So next door, um, we actually have um, our one of our newest recently uh, babies is a long-nosed viper. So right up here in this corner. Oh, all the way in the back. Yeah, this is actually visual for the guests uh, in the gallery right now. <laughs> so uh, this animal actually uh, was born, and I say born, not hatched, um, because vipers uh, are essentially live bearing snakes. Um, mm -hmm. Their eggs are actually incubated inside the female, the mom, wow. and then as the baby snake comes out, it comes out um, not in an egg. So uh, this animal was born uh, last week, uh, maybe almost two weeks ago. Oh my goodness. Okay, well that's such a great example too. I'm glad that you brought that up. This isn't all about hatching. I know we're gonna talk a little bit about incubation, but sometimes not all reptiles get incubated. They do that themselves and they actually have live birth instead. Hopefully y'all are able to see this individual. Somebody knew that we were doing a Z learning feature and decided to slither on out. And um, this individual, actually, we do not have an exhibit currently for the adults. So yeah. this animal right now, you can only see uh, as a baby. Um, and it will actually go through a color change. Its parents are kind of a bright um, orangey brick red color. So it's a little Gorgeous. dull right now, but um, as it grows, it will kind of get this really bright orange color to it. Well, and Karen, that's something that I always love to bring up when I'm here in the Aquarium and Reptile Complex, because people go through all the galleries, they see all of their favorite residents from the snakes to the different lizards, geckos, or the aquarium species. But people don't realize there are so many more animals and more species behind the scenes exclusively. Why do you all do that? Right, so um, we try to work with um, 
whatever species uh, we're able to work with. And some of them don't necessarily um, fit into one of our exhibits already, or we just have so many more animals um, that currently there isn't an exhibit space sure. available to them. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't want to continue to work um, with other species as it sees fit. So um, we do have some animals that are behind the scenes um, and are solely going to be behind the scenes. Yeah, yep. absolutely. It's all a part of those different breeding programs that allows us to have a diverse animal collection, of course. Um, there was a couple of great questions that came in. Rebecca was wondering, where do you find long-nosed vipers out in the wild? Uh, that's a great question. So these guys are found uh, more around Southern Europe. So Interesting. yeah, okay. and into the Middle East, uh, so Austria, Turkey, um, that area. Uh, so they're one of the one of the few European vipers. Amazing, because a lot of times when you think of all these colorful, beautifully patterned snakes, a lot of people think of South America, Asia, Africa, yeah. Southern Europe. I love Southern that. Europe. I learned something new today. Yeah. So as you can see, um, this is a venomous snake. Uh, so I don't know, as Milo panned in, you can see it does have a lock on the enclosure. Um, we do kind of have a red card noting that it's a venomous animal. So that's for our safety, um, where we have all the safety information written down for this species. Oh, Christina, great question. So if the little kiddos, the babies, the offspring are this size, then how big is mom? So the adults of long-nosed vipers are not um, a terribly large viper. Uh, they're probably, as an adult, uh, one and a half, two feet. Sure. So not a super long individual. Molly was wondering that same thing. So at adult size, they can range anywhere from about a foot and a half to about two feet long. Now, a question that I actually had from a coworker earlier this morning before starting this feature was, at this small age, since we are talking about a venomous species right now, are they just as potent as young individuals as they would be into adulthood, or do they get stronger venom? Um, the venom potency is really about the same. Okay, um, wow. The difference with baby uh, venomous snakes is that as a baby, every strike is going to be a defensive strike most likely and so it's more of a scared defending itself um so it's more likely to unload all of the venom at once um, to protect okay. itself whereas an adult can probably gate whether yeah, exactly. uh, something is um a, a scare to them or not um and they can decide they can actually control how much venom they huh. release that is so interesting and that's such a a similar sort of storyline to us even. As we get older, we get more life experiences. We can kind of make better judgment calls. <laughs> Snakes are doing the same thing, same it sounds thing, like. Because yeah. <laughs> when they're young and inexperienced, they're gonna pump out all that venom that they have, which definitely adds to their potency. And they're definitely um, exposed to many, many different predators. So wow. they're at a much greater risk. No, especially being that small size. Yeah. So Susie, two weeks old, was then wondering, how quickly do they grow in size if this one's only just two weeks old? Um, so uh, it'll, for a viper, they grow uh, fairly rapidly compared to some other snakes, like perhaps the green tree python that we were checking out. Um, the adults um, are about three, three and a half years old, and so they are already at their reproductive size, which gotcha. means they're already at a mature adult size. Yep. Oh, Divya, you were wondering, what snake are we looking at right now? We are looking at our long nose viper, and that's a perfect cue. We are actually just going to talk about a different animal. Somebody has done posing for us. Let me go back up so that way you can see that setup yet again. All right, Karen. <laughs> so We just have so much to talk about. What's we next? Do. There's so many things <laughs> in this nursery. Uh, we'll go over to our uh, other two uh, animals that we have. So... Um, we have a couple of different gecko species. Um, <laughs> some of our leaf tail geckos uh, that are right in front of us. So um, we have a varying rotating um, between all the different uh, leaf tail gecko species. Right now, it looks like we have some mossy leaf tail geckos hanging out in here. Um, and then also next door are the day geckos. Um, they're really bright green. Let's see. Oh, they're on the public yeah, side. They're they, showing off for our guests here. Let me go yeah, ahead. I'm going to see past Karen real quick. Oh, there we are. There we are. Look at that cute little green face. So they are replicas of their parents, just in super tiny form. 
Perfect. Okay, so those of you who've been tuning in to Z Learning ever since the beginning, so I know there's a lot of you out there, you remember our feature with our geckos, specifically our leaf tail geckos. We actually didn't talk very much about our day geckos with Sean. And one other great example of we have hundreds and hundreds of geckos here on site, but only a small handful that actually are out on display for y'all to see. Now, these individuals have still a lot of growing to do, don't they? They do, um, and the leaf tail geckos that are in here are actually more of like a sub-adult um, at this sure. point. Um, when they hatch, they are actually, I don't know if you can see my fingers, yeah. they are probably about that size. So they've grown a lot. Um, so yeah, these guys have grown quite a bit, um, and as more hatch, uh, they get rotated into the general population for sense. breeding, and um, sure. Sean handles all of that stuff for us. Well, and um, another fascinating thing too, a lot of times people ask, you know, we have all these hatchings, we have all these individuals born even here in the reptile collection. They don't all stay here, do they? No, so uh, that's a really cool part about having this nursery is that um, you can come multiple times and perhaps see different things come and go from the nursery. So as we uh, get new babies, um, we want to be able to show them as well. So we're definitely going to be rotating um, these babies out uh, for viewing. Oh my goodness, I just realized there's a gecko right to the left <laughs> of who I've been looking at. <laughs> that is great camouflage. I didn't even notice that individual. Absolutely. So yeah, even at tiny age, they're, they're very they are <laughs> very adapted to staying hidden and not becoming a snack. That's right. But next time you're at Riverbanks, swing on by over here to our reptile nursery. Karen's absolutely right. Every time you come to visit, there's going to be new individuals and they grow and they change and they'll be rotating and it's a great way to really check in those of you who are regulars to riverbanks those members out there first of all thank you for being a member and second off if you're coming all the time check out these individuals see how much they grow during your weekly visits because it's really interesting to see so up close especially here in this new habitat all those growth and achievements that they're doing all right so we talked a little bit about our youngsters right we've been skipping over this thing in the middle <laughs> what is this so this is one of our many incubators um and right now it has some gecko eggs in it Ooh. so i know um when sean did the uh, leaf tail gecko uh feature that he also showed you some of the eggs so these aren't all of the eggs that we have they're just out here so guests can see sure um so all of our incubators that we have, we're able to set them at different temperatures because all these different species actually require different uh, incubating parameters. So whether it's uh, the temperature, where the humidity, sure, or the, sure. even the yep. substrate that the eggs are incubated on. So you'll see these gecko eggs are on kind of a semi-damp moss, um, which is what Sean has found to be one of the most successful um, substrates for them to, to hatch on. As far as their egg health and development, right. that makes perfect sense. Oh, by the way, good morning, Mark. Thanks for tuning in. Um, my, Molly, also, if you're wondering, where are we? Let me pan up really quick, not to cut Karen off, but we're actually in front of one of our viewing galleries. You can see us in the reflection. But <laughs> we're right across from our King Cobra habitat here, kind of in our tropical gallery. Yeah in our reptile and aquarium complex. But these aren't our only eggs that we have here. Do we have other incubators? We do. So behind us, uh, we Ooh. have a wall of different incubators. So over here, we have uh, one of our incubators, which is about at 80 degrees, whereas the um, incubator that the gecko eggs are in is about 72. Okay. That's um, a huge degree difference yeah, if you're an egg. Yeah, very big difference. And, and the slightest change in temperature can actually affect whether something will hatch. So it is very important to have a very oh. stable um, temperature requirement. Um, so in this incubator are pine snake eggs. So those guys, pine snakes, uh, we have on exhibit in our South Carolina gallery, um, mm -hmm. in our pine flats exhibit with uh, some of our rattlesnakes. So we had two females, um, each lay a clutch of eggs. Um, and so they're incubating, um, you can see their substrate is different. Uh, yeah. It's actually incubating on a perlite. So it's kind of like a gardening uh, material okay, and it's gotcha. essentially um, <laughs> helping keep uh, a consistent humidity for these eggs. So it right. spreads out uh, water um, so that they have the right humidity for hatching. And I'm so glad you explained that because I bet a lot of people, maybe including myself, thought, is it packing peanuts? <laughs> is, it, is it snow? That doesn't make any sense. It's 80 degrees. Why would it be that? How many eggs are in here though? There's quite a lot that are hidden. Yeah, yeah. There's quite a lot. Let me see if I can uh, pop this 
can take a look inside. Oh, check it out, everybody. So their eggs are quite large. They um, really are. Yep. So, and as you see, this egg right here, yeah. um, it actually was not a fertilized egg, which is why gotcha. it appears to look quite yep. ugly. No, yeah, very <laughs> and different. And that looking. happens um, sometimes. Not all the eggs are necessarily fertilized. Sure. So we do have eggs that uh, we would say go bad. Sure. Um, well, that happens out in the wild, too. Right, it's absolutely. all a part of the more eggs an animal lays, the better chance that they are going to be raised in survival. So big clutch sizes like this are important for raising young. Yep. Um, and as these eggs get closer to uh, hatching, um, you see they're um, right here, they're quite turgid and yeah. round and plump eggs. And this as they get wrinkly. closer, closer yeah. to hatching, um, they will actually start to uh, dent in and um, snakes have egg tooths and that's how they break through the egg and hatch out. That is so interesting. Oh, Susie, I love this question that you just sent in. We'll go ahead and let Karen close that up so that we, we maintain the temperature. But Susie is wondering, so if a snake is pregnant on exhibit who has live birth, are the young then quickly removed from the exhibit after birth? Yeah, so typically we actually try to uh, take the female off exhibit sure. um, so that that doesn't happen because some of our exhibits, uh, especially if it's a venomous snake, um, can be quite uh, entangling to make sure you get them safely yeah. off the exhibit. So um, we are typically cued in that a female is gravid or pregnant. Yep. Um, and then also it helps reduce her stress a bit to also be off exhibit right before she's sure. about to give birth to those babies. It's almost like the maternity ward. She kind of right. has a private area where she can do her business if she needs to. Right. But that's also safer for the youngsters then too because naturally out in the wild don't worry once the babies hatch or are born mom is done there is no sort of parental care so don't worry we're not taking the babies from mom we're removing them so that way they can obviously be raised in a safer environment and get their specialized care but as far as maternal instincts mom just gives birth lays those eggs and she's pretty much done when it comes to snakes Right. What else do we have here, though? These are so, some different looking incubators. Yeah, so we have, we have lots of uh, eggs incubating right now. Um, we have in this incubator right here, some coral snake eggs. So that's also a native venomous snake uh, to South Carolina. Um, so let me go ahead and open this up. Oh, These were laid in the very beginning of June. Look at the size difference of those. So also, um, if you imagine uh, one of our coral snakes, which is much smaller than the pine snake, uh, these are still a decent size uh, really for are. the female to lay. So that's typically how we can tell that they are gravid is they have a swelling um, towards their mid body. Uh, we can tell that uh, the eggs are, they've yeah. got eggs to lay for us. That is so interesting. Now, a lot of you are wondering, how do we keep track of the different eggs? How do we know? Well, our Animal care specialists, our professionals like Karen and the rest of our herpetology staff monitor all of our animals so closely. They also know the biology of our different species. So they know how long incubation takes, how long are females usually gravid for, how long do they retain those eggs before laying them. And they're really monitoring all these things so, so closely to provide our high quality of care, but then also to provide for healthy incubation and successful hatching. And then obviously raising these new individuals. But so amazing that we've been able to take all of these incubator units, including all of these nursery bedrooms, we can call them, all these little mini habitats, and bring them out on display for all of you to now see when you come here to Riverbanks. So once again, let me go ahead and pan up. We don't have a bunch of guests right here in front of the window. I know it's a whole lot of glare. You can see Karen <laughs> and, and me too. <laughs> but right now we're in our tropical gallery. It's right next door to actually where it leads over to the aquarium over in this doorway. We're right across from our Bolin's pythons, our king cobras. So I encourage y'all, next time you're here, swing by and check in on our new reptile nursery. But before we say goodbye, thanks so much, Karen. Thank you. You did an amazing job with the tour. I love that I got to sit back and learn along with everybody yeah. for Z learning. So thank you so much. I appreciate yeah, it. Absolutely. Now, everybody who tuned in this morning, thank you for tuning in for Z learning. I know we've been on a little bit of hiatus. And Jim, you're wondering kind of what is our Z learning schedule? It's been a little all over the place. We're starting to adapt to more of a once a week schedule. So that way we can have a big one big week f finale, you could say, every Wednesday. 
but we're not finishing Z Learning. In fact, the reason why we never really mentioned our new schedule of sorts was because next week is National Zookeeper Week and we are doing lives every single day. So Monday through Friday, we're gonna have a live feature with some of our zookeepers in all different areas with brand new features we've never done before for Z Learning. So those of you who are not getting enough of a Z Learning kick during your weekdays, I encourage you to put it on your schedule for next week because it is National Zookeeper Week and we got a whole lot we get to share with you next week. But in the meantime, thanks so much for tuning in live here this morning and keep sending out in those questions and we will see you all again live next Monday morning at 10 a.m. Thanks everybody.